Hi. This is the Uno Synth Pro X, based on the original great sounding Uno Synth Pro mono and paraphonic synth, but with substantial interface improvements compared to the original. All the sounds you're hearing in this intro, unless I got a copyright strike, come from this synth. Like the original, it has three analog oscillators, two analog filters that can be routed into each other or in parallel, and a three-slot digital effects section. It also has three envelopes, two LFOs, and a comprehensive mod matrix, an arpeggiator and sequencer. In this video, I'll take a look at what's new compared to the original, an in-depth look at the workflow, and pros and cons of this new version. I'll also play you all its presets in the end. Before I start, a quick disclosure. IK sent this over for review. No money changed hands. They have no say over the content of this video and don't get to see it before it's published. This channel is funded mainly by viewers who subscribe to exclusive content and book updates on Patreon, YouTube Premium and ads, and price check affiliate links in the description, which help the channel regardless of the product you choose to buy. Okay, let's start with a comparison between the Uno Synth Pro X, which I'll just call X to keep this video under an hour, to the original Uno Synth Pro, which I'll call the OG from now on, again for the same reasons. The most important and obvious difference is that the interface on the X has been completely reworked in a way that makes it much more of an instrument with way more and smarter hands-on controls compared to the original. Even though both the analog and digital elements are almost identical in both, having hands-on controls compared to the more menu-style matrix controls fixes the biggest con I mentioned in my review of the original and really transforms X into something that plays like a totally different synth. It's not entirely knob per function. Many of the modules have toggles, say, to choose which oscillator you're controlling, which envelope, which LFO, and which effect. And many of the buttons and knobs have shift functions labeled on the panel. So for example, I'm controlling oscillator level unshifted and here noise level when shifted, but overall things are much more accessible. There are occasionally additional parameters that you need to access in a menu. You can do that either by going into the preset menu and then choosing the module and then diving in and editing the parameter. But there's a shortcut to avoid this. So say for example, that I wanted to edit the reverb parameters. Once you touch one of the modules parameters and then press the data encoder, you get direct access to that modules parameters. It's also much easier to make mod matrix connections. You've got direct controls for source, destination, amount, and choosing the mod slot. These are now selected using this encoder, which is a click encoder, which is much easier than it was on the original. Price-wise, this is more expensive than the original. I tend to not to like to quote prices in my videos because they fluctuate, but I'm told the X will cost about $100 more than the OG, so it's definitely more expensive. The other price you pay in exchange for more knobs and hands-on controls is that the pitch and mod strips are gone and you only get an octave of these little buttons. You can, of course, transpose it. As opposed to two and a half octaves of membrane keys on the original, I don't think it's a big loss. Neither of these is velocity sensitive. And if you really want to play a synth live, either on the X or the OG, hook up a proper MIDI keyboard and you'll be good to go. Speaking of which, another difference is that there's no longer, at least as of the making of this video, a keyboard version of the X as opposed to the original. Another new feature on the Uno Synth Pro X is that it has a baseline mode intended to make it behave like a 303 with support for accents and direct on-panel controls for accent depth and decay. And there are a few other things that change when you get into baseline mode. Now, just to be clear, the X isn't designed to be a 303 clone and it doesn't sound exactly like one. This just helps you quickly get it to behave and sound in a similar way. There are a few other differences. The X has a third envelope. There are a few new effect types. So for example, the reverb has a uh, shimmer type. And there are a few parameters that you can configure here. There's a new VCA amount control. If you just want to create drones. There's a new sequence randomizer function. So let's see what happens. 
This randomizes multiple parameters and you can also have it adhere to a scale. And you can now choose to load either a sound or a sequence or both when you load up a patch. There are a few things that the OG has that this doesn't. I think the main ones are lack of a song mode here, at least as of the current firmware. And you can no longer press these buttons to quickly access a preset, which may or may not be a good thing. You might lose your preset if you quickly swap to a different one and don't save it. You also can't use these buttons for quick access to parameters like you could on the original, but you don't really need that here, I think. So those are the differences. Aside from that, the guts of the X and the original are very similar. Both have three analog oscillators that can be stacked or played paraphonically. Paraphonic means in this context that they share the same filter and articulation. The way it handles envelopes is that the first note that you play gets the envelope articulation. So let's say open up the attack here to make it slow. Then subsequent notes will be turned on and off immediately. If you play an additional note and release the first note, that'll be released immediately as well. And then when I release the last note, it will get whatever release articulation you planned for in the patch. The filter structure is also the same two filters which can be routed in parallel or in series, though how you control these filters is dramatically different from the OG. In the OG, filter selection was combined to two major parameters that had a bunch of different options to choose from in each. Here, everything has been split out to independent buttons, so it's easy to choose between low pass and high pass, two pole, four pole, parallel or series, and phase swap. Anyway, but the guts are the same. Both are actually the same size and the enclosure is identical, though the top panel on the X is metal as opposed to the quite fingerprint magnet plastic on the original. Both still take the same time to shut down and more importantly, boot up. Takes about 25 seconds from start to finish, but at least here you get a little progress bar to see how it's going. And I'll fast forward through this. Both can store 256 presets, and in terms of connectivity, they're almost identical. Both have MIDI in and out, balanced quarter-inch outputs, which is excellent. Both have a 3.5 millimeter headphone output and an audio input, and you can route that audio either before the filter and effects or post-filter and effects, and that audio input or pass-through is in mono. Both also have CV gate outputs and inputs, and then what's different is that the X has a USB-C port, which can be used both for power and for MIDI connecting to a computer, as opposed to micro USB on the original, and then the X also has a proper power input and comes with a power supply, as opposed to just another micro USB port for power on the original. The company recommends using the power supply to help reduce potential noise problems and maintain tuning stability. I tried powering the X over USB and it worked just fine for me, but I won't take any chances for this video. Both the X and the OG have a standalone editor and plugin, though the interface is different to match their respective design and interface. And at least as of now, you can't transfer presets from the original to the X. So let's dive a little bit deeper and take a look at how this interface works. I'll start with the oscillators. You've got a toggle to choose which oscillator you want to control. And if you want to control all three simultaneously, you long press this button and control them all at once. Let's just start with oscillator one. Waveforms are just like the original. So you've got a morph from sort of almost a triangle to square and to pulse. You can modulate through these shapes by pointing an LFO to this parameter. You need to be mindful of level changes between the different shapes. And if you want, say, just pulse width modulation, you need to set the LFO depth just right so that it doesn't skip a shape to the next one. By the way, as, as you look at the scope, you'll see these little lines run around the shape. That's because there's a bit of a crosstalk between the oscillators. You can see it change slightly as I change the tuning of the other oscillators. I don't quite hear it now, but there are some situations where you hear just a bit of it. I did notice a slight bleed of the oscillators at the end of a long release stage. It's not very noticeable, but I thought I'd mention it. I also mentioned it to the company and they said that they could fine tune it so that it works like the original, which doesn't have this issue. Signal to noise, I think, by the way, is generally acceptable, but say if you close the filter and then amplify levels a lot, noise will start to be apparent. Again, it's a matter of how much you're sensitive to that and you might need to adjust for that in the mix. Aside from the regular shapes and morphing, you've got a few cross mod options for oscillators two and three. 
So let's lower the level of oscillator one and hop on to oscillator two. So you've got FM, FM mod depth control here. And obviously the ratio between the oscillators one and two matters for the particular FM timbre you get. Let's turn that down for oscillator two. You've also got sync. And generally for sync, you want wave shapes with more harmonics like saw or square. And to get the proper oscillator sync effect, you need to make sure that the frequency of oscillator two is higher than the frequency of oscillator one. And then you get the oscillator sync effect by modulating the frequency of oscillator two. Let's turn sync off. And then oscillator two also has a ring mod option for extra metallic craziness. That too also depends both on the frequency of oscillator two and of oscillator one. So those are the cross mods and pretty much it for the oscillators apart from glide. And if we turn them all down, you've also got a noise generator. I already mentioned the paraphonic mode earlier. You can play all three oscillators if you remember to turn their level up and remember you press this button to control all of them at once. They also have to be tuned relative to each other. If you want, by the way, you can tune them separately. So let's say tune this one an octave up. Notice the first oscillator starts an octave higher. You don't have a dynamic unison mode here like you do say in the sub 37. So in the sub 37, when you press one note in paraphonic mode, then all three oscillators will play. And then as you press additional notes, those will be stolen away from the first note and be used to play a chord. Here, each oscillator gets played only when you press its key. Let's move on and talk about the filters. I think this is where the synth really shines, not only because the interface is hands-on, but because it has two of them. Let's start with a routing in series to begin with. The first filter is an OTA filter and both have cutoff and resonance controls. In this case, it's a tuple filter, 12 dB per octave. Resonance here doesn't self-oscillate. And the uh, advantage of this filter is that it also has a high-pass mode with resonance. So that's what this sounds like. And then let's open that back up way wide and go into low pass mode. Then the second filter is a 24 dB per octave filter, or at least it has that option. It's got a two pole option and a four pole option for a sharper slope. And its resonance does decrease the bass a bit, but not too much and can go pretty wild. Into almost MS-20 levels. So it's four pole, but it's no Moog or Roland filter. Way more aggressive. Let's kick it all the way up. So that's resonance in, uh, in four pole mode and then in two pole mode. Gets, I guess, uh, chalky in a different way, but also will self oscillate. Now you can play the filter if you increase filter tracking. It doesn't track precisely, at, uh, at least not at 100%. By the way, if you want to fine tune a parameter, you can always go into here. So it starts to uh, lose tracking after about an octave, maybe two. Anyway, so this second SSI filter will self oscillate. And things get interesting when you start to use both filters together. Both in low pass make a six pole filter. And if you put filter one in high pass mode, you can start by making a band pass filter. And you can link them. So now they move together as a single band pass filter where this second knob now controls the spacing between the filters. Also something very unique, most synths with band pass filters don't have control over the bandpass width. Nor, of course, have resonance on both ends if you want. So this is a nice way to create sort of 
informant like sounds. Really cool. Uh, way more than a bandpass filter here. This is definitely one of the strengths of this synth. Now the face doesn't matter too much, I think, when they're routed in series. Let's toggle it. Very similar timbre. But it does if you get into parallel routing. So let's maybe make things a bit more tame, turn down resonance, and then I'll move the low pass filter and the high pass filter apart, but in opposite directions compared to the band pass situation before. And that's how we create a notch filter. Remember to keep the filters linked if you want to control the notch with one knob. And you can modulate this for analog style phaser effects, or just go ahead and again, increase resonance and go wild on one or both filters. Get a much more aggressive notch filter sound. And don't forget to play with the phase. Again, depending on what the filters are doing, it may or may not matter. So those are the filters. After the filters, audio gets routed into a analog drive circuit. So this is with drive and without drive. Once you go there, it's hard to go back. So these are the reasons you get an analog synth. Let's go back to an init preset and take a listen to the effects. You've got three of them, modulation, delay, and reverb. You've got a mount control for each and then three different parameters on the panel which change based on the effect. So dry with no effects. And then chorus, sounds very nice. Delay. And you've got a bunch of controls here for the delay, filter, feedback. The delay doesn't let you go crazy with feedback, it goes only up to 80%, so maybe 80 but not quite to 11. It doesn't go into self-oscillation, different times, and those are the three on-panel controls. We can get into the menu and go back in here and choose yeah, whether it's in sync or not, and then choose the type. Let's go say for ping pong. And if you want your own custom ping pong rhythms, then go back into the stereo delay and you can choose different timings for the left and right. Which I think is pretty cool. But you've got control over this, both left and right. Now let's turn that down and check out the reverbs. Nice reverb, especially since you've got filtering. So if you feel like it's too aggressive on the highs, turn it down there size control and time it can get pretty long kind of sounds like a bit of a spring reverb there and you can choose the type here that's hall apparently there's actually no spring in here there's a plate, and then there's a shimmer, which is a very interesting one. It can do shimmer-like effects, and you've got control over pitch with two different pitch shifters. But where I think it gets super interesting is when you start messing with diffusion. That's no shimmer, but it certainly sounds interesting. 
This makes me want to pass whatever this is through an external reverb. So that's the signal chain. Let's briefly talk about modulation. This is just like the original Synth Pro, except you've got a third envelope and it's way easier to map sources to destinations. You've got three envelopes, a filter envelope, which is pretty easy to control with envelope amount and ADSR controls on the panel. The accent decay and accent kick in in 303 mode when you use the sequencer, we'll get to that in a bit. Anyway, that's the filter envelope. There's also uh, an amp envelope. If you want a slow attack 303. And then the third envelope, which you access with shift and the LFOs are mappable using the mod matrix. They're not mapped by default to anything. So say if I wanted to map LFO one to the filter cutoff, I would pick a mod slot by hitting these two together. Slot one is empty, so that's cool. Then hold source and then turn or press one of the LFO buttons and it's now a source in the slot. And then hold the destination button and wiggle the destination knob a bit. And then pick the amount. Pick the wave. You've got the usual suspects. Random is a slewed sample and hold and sample and hold is a sharp random. Then there's noise. We've got tempo sync for the LFOs and you can have them fade in. Very gradually if you like. By the way, each of the mod matrix slots also has a fade in. So if you hit, uh, here we go, back in here, then there's a fade in per slot in the mod matrix. As far as the envelopes go, you can choose whether they re-trigger in legato mode or not, or control re-triggering individually. And you also have a looping option. So if we go back to the filter envelope, then we can turn on looping. Then aside from the parameters you can touch, there are a few that you can't. So if we tap sources, I'll go through the sources very quickly. There's velocity, mod wheel, aftertouch, and a whole bunch of parameters here. For example, even the level knob or oscillator level, you can use that to modulate a destination. So quite a few sources. The uh, destination side isn't as rich. You've got plenty of destinations, but you can't, for example, control any of the individual envelope parameters. Say if you want to modulate decay, like I just did manually for the looping envelope. And say, for example, you don't have access to all the effect parameters except the effect amount. A few other things about the mod matrix. Let's uh, maybe go and uh, create an init preset. And the reason I went to an empty slot to create an init preset is because if you do init a patch, then uh, it will overwrite what's stored in that location. I don't know why, I think they should change that. Anyway, if you do create an init preset and then go into the um, mod matrix, you'll notice that some of the slots are pre-populated, which is cool if you like it, but if not, you might wanna create your own init preset. So for example, the mod wheel is uh, mapped to the filter cutoff, velocity to amp envelope amount, aftertouch. Um, CV is fine, I think, but you might wanna disable these based on your patch making style. Let's talk about the arpeggiator and sequencer. The arpeggiator is simple and works nicely. You've got hold. And with shift, these buttons will choose different playback styles. The first 13 buttons control the arpeggiator in this mode. The three on the right control the sequencer playback directions. You've got three octave modes. So that's pretty nice. And I think one of the cool ARP features here is that you can change the rhythm of the ARP. The ARP goes through this pattern and you can introduce rests into the pattern, which can create interesting rhythms, I think. And then there's the sequencer. I'll clear the sequence here. You can choose the number of steps up to 64. Let's just go for say eight to keep it simple. And then you can either step sequence or play into a sequence live. If you want to play into a sequence live, you get a metronome. 
which is very loud by default, but you can change its levels. Let's uh, maybe just play something randomly in here. Everything's quantized and ties weren't recorded here for some reason, but you can add ties and accents manually. So let's check that out. See if I wanted to indeed uh, introduce ties here or accents, which you'd need to activate either using the shift functions or just go into baseline mode. Let's maybe tone down the reverb a bit. And in baseline mode, by the way, like I mentioned, you've got accent depth and decay controls along with regular controls. And then you can also step sequence as long as record is enabled, you just hold the step and play a note into that step. So you can step sequence. This also works in paraphonic mode. So if I go into paraphonic mode and turn up the level of all my oscillators, then you can sequence chords. You can erase these notes. So that's my chord. When you step sequence, you can hold a step and look at all of the parameters of that step. I've got three steps here. So I've got notes for each and velocity and length for each. Let's maybe add a tie here. You can also automate parameters in a sequence when it's playing. Now I think there's a limit on how many parameters you can sequence. Let's go for an empty pattern, just sequence something simple. So just this, you hold a step, then turn parameters to parameter lock them to change them for that step. One, two, three automations per step. Let's keep turning parameters and see if we hit a limit. Not all the parameters are available for automation. Let's keep going. Yeah, I think we can do this for a while. So quite a few. Let's see what else we've got. I mentioned earlier, you can randomize a pattern. Notice the swing, there's a swing, of course, so that gets randomized too. And we can reduce it if we don't like it. Change length maybe to something. Okay. Um, what else? We've got transpose options. Let's maybe make this shorter. And note to self, next time activate the scale function. Anyway, we'll live with this pattern. If I want to transpose it, just hit shift and transpose and then either use the menu or the built-in keyboard or an external keyboard to transpose this horrible pattern. I'm sorry. That's what you get when you randomize patterns. Anyway, one more feature to go through is gate. And this applies to all the notes in the pattern. And it goes from pretty short to ties. And that works for the sequencer too. You can actually create gate triggers in the sequencer. So if I say, uh, go back to here, gate, and turn off ARP. Go to sequence gates. You can actually sequence those as well and uh, choose the overall global gate length for the steps you activated. And this is separate, by the way, from the length parameter. You also have length control here for each step. So that's the sequencer overall and the arpeggiator. Not many complaints here. I think if I had to, then I would like to be able to delete automations across the sequence. Right now, you can only do that on a per step basis. And if you've programmed an automation for a knob, you can't override that once the sequence is playing. I think it would be nice to either take control of a parameter when a sequence is playing, or maybe even better yet, create an offset for those automations using the knobs on the panel. So that's pretty much it for the synth. IK Multimedia also created an editor. So if I load up a patch, it'll also load up in the editor. And you also see automations in the editor as they happen with a synth, which is cool. The editor also works as a plugin if you want to run that in your DAW. I think it was very necessary for the original Synth Pro. Not so much for this in terms of sound design. In the making of this video, I created quite a few of my own patches and I never felt like I uh, needed the editor to do that. 
The only place where I did find it useful is if I uh, created a patch and I wanted to change its name. It's kind of a pain to do that uh, using the encoder. It's way easier to just go into here, type a patch name, and save that in. But if, say, you want to learn how a certain factory patch is set up, then you can see all the knob values or go into the matrix and see any modulation. And of course, you will want to use this if you want to get presets back and forth. Okay, let's talk about pros and cons for Uno Synth Pro X. On the pros side, it's a very characterful sounding monophonic and paraphonic synth, which with its three oscillators, two resonant filters, drive, and effects has a pretty broad timbral range. It can get into aggressive territory very quickly with three oscillators and cross mods and drive, but it can also be coaxed into being gentle if needed. And with two filters and parallel or series routing, you've got a lot of control over your sound. I showed you earlier, especially when you bring in resonance and spacing, there are very few mono synths that can do this at any price range. And even for poly synths, if you want this in analog, expect to pay up. I'll play you the intro and all of its presets at the end of this video so you can judge for yourself if the colors that this can make are to your taste. Beside sound, the controls you get considering this small size are excellent. I did find myself occasionally knocking a nearby parameter out of place accidentally, so you do need to watch for that, but it's certainly better to have all these knobs than not. Also on the pros side, it has digital effects and digital control, meaning that you can save presets. It may sound obvious to you, but there are many analog synths out there that can't save presets or don't have built-in effects. Again, certainly at this price range, obviously there are way more expensive synths that can do both. Then on the cons side, IK Multimedia have solved the biggest problem that I had with the original Uno Synth Pro, and that's its interface. Now, one thing that also bothered me a bit in the original and is a little bit more pronounced, at least in this firmware, is that the oscillator bleed and noise did make its way here. These aren't much of an issue if you're creating patches that are firing on all oscillator drive and filter cylinders, but when you create quieter patches with a more closed filter, you might start to hear this, especially if you're recording multiple layers of the synth in your DAW, and this bleed can be amplified by the effects. I asked IK Multimedia about this and they said they try to address this in a firmware update. And if you listen to the presets I play later, you probably won't hear it. It's mostly something you hear at the tail end of sounds with a long release until a VCA closes down. So with many of the other cons of the original out of the way, the only major thing that I can think of here is price compared to other offerings out there. There are a whole bunch of other analog, mainly Behringer monosynths out there for about one to $200 less than this. So you can get feature-rich analog monosynths for less, but those typically aren't paraphonic, don't have effects, and can't save presets. There are other options with presets at a similar price, like the Base Station 2 from Novation, and even some polyphonic options like the Minilogue from Korg. And then if you're willing to spend $100 more, there are quite a few other polyphonic options like the DeepMind 6, the Hybrid Mini Freak, both of which have monophonic and polyphonic modes. And then if you're willing to go all digital, another interesting, slightly more expensive option is the Hydrosynth Explorer. So tough choices for sure. In terms of feature wishlist, I don't have major complaints considering the scope of what this is. It's a pretty mature product. There's no song mode like the original, if that's important to you. And I think that choosing an init preset shouldn't erase the preset you're currently on. There are some bugs with the editor, but it may be just that it's a beta. And I mentioned earlier in the sequencer section, I think it should be easier to clear an automation from an entire sequence and to override it. Overall though, I have to say that if the price and sound are to your taste, this is a great synth to do some analog synthing on. Creating the 15 or so patches I needed to make for the intro to this video was very fast. I never felt held back by the interface or the synth to reach the sound that I wanted, of course, within the scope of what this can offer. So that's it for Uno Synth Pro X. If you're ever lost with what to do with 16 mod slots and all the other features here, there are plenty of synth tips and ideas in my ever expanding book available to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful, ring the YouTube bell below if you wanna make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.
Yeah.